Um, so I'm pleased to uh, introduce Chris Caddo. Uh, Chris received his master's um, equivalent at the Free University of Berlin in 2011 and his PhD at the same place in um, 2018. He's currently head of the data analysis department at, I'm not going to attempt to pronounce that in German, but it, uh, in English it's the German Climate Computing Center. How do, what's the German pronunciation for it? Okay. <laughs> Tough, right? A lot of we got it. <laughs> <laughs> His work involves uh, several topics related to Earth system models, including analysis of high resolution kilometer scale climate simulations, um, improving performance and analysis of Earth system models with AI and seasonal and decadal prediction. So I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for the for the intro. So what I usually do is right. I bring uh, candy from Germany and I, I give it around, and it's so cool. Uh, Paul and Rebecca just brought me kind of a kind of a rain geek got here to kind of put the, the sweets in. So that's always the nice thing for the offline people, right? So the online people have to kind of deal with that. So just <laughs> give it a run, right? So, and it has a lot, right? So eat it. Um, <laughs> um, exactly, Paul has to eat it then, right? So. Uh, Great, so I, I, I already heard today I won the prize for the most buzzwords in the title. Um, that's probably true, right? We added even now 3D printer, right? So, um, so um, what, I, what I really want to do uh, today is kind of give you a glimpse, is that working? Of exactly, so I, I, I give you an introduction to the DKRZ, um, a little bit around my climate research, but not much more the challenges uh, targeted in this talk. Um, I will talk about a little bit the cutting edge image in painting for reconstruction of missing climate information. I make a really quick tour through other applications, um, so you will not understand anything if you're not in the field. Um, and then I um, will give some first steps actually towards digital twins of 3D printed weather stations. Um, so who was at this talk like in fall 2022? when I was at M cubed, right? So who was, because not so many, good, good. So because for you guys, eat candy, right? The first part is the same, right? So um, I hope that's fine. Uh, so just in case you forgot where you are, right? We are right now in Colorado here in Boulder County. I always love to visit. Um, this is Germany um, in, within Europe and the northern part there is Hamburg, the city where the DKRZ is located. Um, I usually bring some nice stuff, kind of inter comparison stuff with me. Also this first joke I already brought with me last time. So the German ancestry in Colorado is uh, listed the largest, right? So who has German ancestry? Oh, here we go, here we go. Um, it's 20% in Colorado, um, but German spoken is 0.5, right? What happened, right? So I, I what, what, what happened in, right? So that, uh, at least Rebecca is here, right? Um, that's good, you keep it up, you're the 0 0.5 here, that's, that's amazing. So you eat a lot of hamburger, but of course the hamburger was invented in Hamburg. I mean, that's basically what the name says, right? It was fish in the first place. We have still these fish buns actually in Hamburg. Um, but finally, the cheeseburger was invented in Colorado, right? It was firstly mentioned in, in Denver uh, somewhere in the, in the I, I don't remember the, the name, uh, the, the, the date exactly. So then when I tell the people at home that I go to Boulder, they think about this. Because this is the German word, what we do when we climb, basically, that's boulder. And they ask me if I'm going to do boulder in boulder, and I say no. That's, that's not my thing, actually. So, um, but then they ask, ah, then you do Mardi Gras, right? Because this week is Mardi Gras. You do it here in Colorado? And they say, no, the Coloradans don't do Mardi Gras, actually. But in Germany, it's a big thing, right? So the streets are packed with people. Um, kind of, we make fun about our politicians, right? Um, and you get a lot of candy. I could throw that stuff as well, but I thought I'd give it around, right? Um, and my, my niece and my nephews um, do still real carnival, so Mardi Gras, I don't, we, the grown-ups don't do this just in certain parts in Germany, actually. So um, as you already heard, the, the German Climate Computing Center is kind of the, the HPC. You see our HPC here for the German community around climate computing. We are still the only HPC center which focuses on climate science. Um, in the world, um, and the idea is basically to unlock the potential of the technological progress for climate research. Our shareholders are the Max Planck Institute for Metrology, the Climate Service Center in um, Germany, the University of Hamburg, and the Helmholtz Center for Coastal Research. 
Um, brand new since last year, um, we have a new department. We thought that next to data management, applications, systems, and scientific computing, we maybe need a little bit more focus on the analysis part, and that's why we have a new department which focuses on data mining, handling, scientific software development, and of course, AI and ML. Um, the cool thing is that we have like access to so much data, right? So we have petabytes of data um, lying at the HPC. We have kind of, uh, I think, nearly 200 petabytes pure storage and kind of even, even more on tape. Um, that makes kind of a lot of fun if you want to do machine learning because you can train your models on, on really cool stuff. Um, and I just brought my other side of that department with me, the Freeber part, the analysis platform. Uh, I gave a couple of years back at your talk here at NCA as well. Um, yes, so let's jump into the topic of machine learning. So um, there's a certain word for when you kind of reconstruct an image that's called image in painting. It's basically re restoration, right? So everybody knows that. So we have paintings or photographs, and over time, you kind of, these things get broken. On the left side, you see kind of uh, um, uh, a painting of the Sanctuary Merge, uh, Mercy Church in Boya, Spain. And this is, of course, not the ground truth, because the ground truth is even older, right? It's a photograph of something, and then over time, it get broken. And there was the restorator who said, like, yeah, I can restorate that, no problem. The human being started on it, and this was what was coming out. <laughs> that was a huge success for, this, for the church because uh, everybody wanted to see that. Everybody went to Boya, Spain. They got so rich by it. Um, that was a total, total success in terms of restoration. And on the right side, you have a photograph um, with the ground truth in the broken picture, which is also a lie, right? I mean, we don't have a digital picture, and then we have a real picture, and we wait for 100 years so we can restore it. That doesn't make sense. Actually, this is already a restoration with the deep learning algorithm. Um, it's, it's actually pretty, pretty good. I even would say it's better than the original one. Um, but we have, don't have a ground truth to compare with. Um, I usually bring this stuff with me just in case people want to talk with me about how intelligent is AI, um, and then we can compare this to human intelligence. Um, so yeah, can do that later. Um, in 2018, I, 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 got, I saw this video online, right? We watched it together. It's a video from uh, NVIDIA. They're doing image in painting for irregular holes using partial convolutions. And basically, the application is pretty simple. You upload a photograph on the left side, and then you get this little rubber, like in Microsoft Paint or something like that. And you can delete things from that photograph on the left side, like that stone. Um, and on the right side, the AI uh, tries to make the photo as realistic as possible again. And it's pretty live, right? So this bridge doesn't belong into nature, right? We kind of delete it, um, and then it's gone. That was really hot stuff in 2018, right? Everybody has it on their phone right now, right? So this object remover kind of, this is, this is everywhere. Um, but this technique has a little bit more to that. So three things are very, very cool. So we have first, basically, a really good color space linear interpolation. So it kind of checks where in the womb is it. Then you can delete things um, like, like, like everywhere, right? This was unique. You usually had a big blob in the middle, and then you kind of try to infill that blob in the middle. But here you can just do whatever you want. And then now this thing kind of got me really because you can delete things from that image, and if it was trained with something um, with a lot of faces in that case, and you take away an eye, the AI knows, oh, there should be an eye, and I can put back an eye. That's different than the stuff on your phone. Right, so it kind of recognizes stuff and then puts something in. And then, of course, you can do fun stuff like getting a new haircut and just let the AI decide how it should look like. Um, and, or you can use that technology to basically do Photoshop and make these people a little bit younger, right? So getting all the problem areas in the, in, in the face, that old man and... Definitely gets, yeah, this neck area is really bad. Now it looks better. So, and you, you see what happens now when we take away the eye again, right? And then you directly know how this thing was trained. <laughs> so, and I, I really love that they kept this in, right? This is kind of a really important scientific message, right? You need to think about how you want to train your data to do a certain application. If the idea was to turn him at some point into a female, that works, right? And if it's just about the skin and make him younger, Okay, that also worked. But if you kind of actually wanted to inpaint the photograph, um, then probably you have to train that a little bit different. 
Um, so they came up with this technology in 2018. As I said, it's kind of basic stuff on your phone right now. Um, and I was thinking right away, can we use that for climate science, right? So because when we look at our images in the climate past, um, we have a lot of missing values. You see a picture um, where you, wherever you see color, as where there were some temperature measurements on the ground, um, and where gray, where you see the gray, there is none. And this is an annual mean of 2018, right? So this is pretty up-to-date problem. If we go back to the past, it looks even worse, of course, right? This is the month now for January 8050. And kind of you see that we even have more measurements on the ocean than on the land, right? Because the shipping routes and so on, you see the tracks to India and so on. Um, so, and this is what goes into the most important data sets we have when we analyze climate change, right? So this is basically what goes in here and kind of to, 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 to give an answer of like, how did the past look like? It's the, the community did a great job to statistically make these lines valid, but still, if you look at these plots, it kind of, uh, there's something missing, right? So, but the question is, of course, how do we do that? And I make a quick cut here, just make it really short in a way, the idea behind that paper. So we, we kind of trained with climate models and then brought this to the observational space. So we trained on two training data sets. We used first 20CR reanalysis um, between 1870 and 2009. This is one atmospheric model um, from NOAA. Um, it has 56 ensemble members, which is pretty cool. And then you got tons of data you can train your AI on. Um, and then you kind of add the missing values from the original head critique missing values from the past, and you can train it and kind of check if this works. And then to kind of cross-check this whole thing, we used the SEMA-5 historical uh, experiments between 1850 and 2005, right? They, this has nothing to do with reality, just a trend, right? It's just the boundary conditions. No weather is real in that sense. And we had like 35 models, got a lot of data to train with, adding again the same missing value mask, and we could build an AI with that. Um, that was a really shortcut. I, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure you have questions to that. You can ask me later on this. So I just want to give you kind of the, 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 the now the, the, what happened on that journey, right? I usually like to bring that with me. So it took me a day to find a computer with a GPU. I was not at the DKRZ yet. Um, then I installed the original software, downloaded ImageNet, which is quite big, it took me three days. And I run the software in its original mode, two days. And then I got this. So a bunch of photographs. Um, here's the ground truth. You see here the missing values, here the, um, the, the photograph with the missing values, and here you have these two reconstructions from the, from the uh, technology, from the neural network. So I, I was happy that was working. Then I did something really crazy in terms of climate science. I produced JPEGs out of the climate data because I wanted to use the software as it is and don't make a mistake on the fly. So I produced these post stamps of the world and I ran this thing like ImageNet through that stuff, and it actually worked already quite nice, right? If you, if you look at, into certain regions here in the north, I was, I was already quite happy that, okay, this is worth it. Um, let's change this thing and uh, that it can read net city of data, climate data um, as it is, and it took me the most time, actually. Okay, so and then we can look at some, uh, some, now we're looking at data. It's still an image, right? But now we actually done this with data. And this is an example with the warm Pacific. Um, so we put on a missing value mask from the original observations um, just to check that whole thing. And then we have an image like this with a lot of missing values. It's actually somewhere in the 1860s or something like that. And then we just put this image now, so this data, through the trained neural network. And what we got out was this. And this was already quite cool, right? So the, the warm Pacific, we got back the horseshoe pattern over Eurasia, we got, um, not everything went well, right? Over Alaska, for example, you see some, some glimpses um, where, where it's not looking the same, but the cool thing in climate science is we can do a lot of analysis with that, right? So, and this is what we did. Kind of, we could test this whole approach on, uh, on a scientific base. So what you see here is now this ensemble member, which was not part of the training. Um, this is the global mean and the annual mean, and um, it has still all the data, and if we put on the missing value mask, it looks like this. So you see kind of a, a difference between these two, especially in the beginning, of course, where we have a lot of missing data, and we wanted to kind of check if we get with the AI close to the solid line or not. And when we used this um, 20CR AI, um, um, we, we got actually quite close to this, this solid line, and, but even better, 
basically the same result came out when we used the CMIP AI, right, which was done with that completely independent data set. And that kind of made us quite sure that, okay, we are on the right path here, right? We can cross-check everything. We can, we can um, check if uh, the, the results are still valid, even if we go uh, on with the other directions, makes us sure that we can jump to the observations. Um, yeah, here just some, we got some higher correlation. We got some lower RMSE. I will not go into the details. And as I said, cross-validation worked and the climate skill was quite good. Um, what people usually more like than lines are images of maps. Um, that's why I usually bring with me the El Nino from, um, which was actually between 1876 and 1878. Um, and in July 1877, there were horrific rainfalls over South America. And when we would see an El Nino going on in that picture, it would be a large red blob now in the Central Pacific. But due to measurement issues with the ships, um, we actually don't see that, right? And when we reconstruct this image now with our AI, which was trained on 20CR, we actually get this red blob, right? The good thing is, you can prove me wrong because the ground truths you see basically above, right? So we get, that's, that's what I usually say, we get an eye. I don't say that we get the direct eye from that woman, right? We, we just say, okay, there is something in there, some pattern recognition, put it back into the image. And the same thing appears with the CMIP AI. Um, what was, just to give you a glimpse of the statistical analysis the community did before, this is what, what was the picture look, look like before with Krigging. And on the global mean, it's, everything is fine, right? But on the local scale, definitely not. Um, then we also tested stuff with PCA reconstruction. I would just skip that. And the nice anecdote actually is that they found three new grid points uh, in that data set later on after we kind of uh, went into the review process. And they said, check the data again. They got actually some, some new data. And this was really cool because directly in this area, these three grid points were saying, OK, here is something. Here is something going on. Um, that, that made us also pretty happy because we had no chance in seeing that before. Um, um, and just to give you a quick update, this is how HeadQT5 looks like, so the newest version from us. And this is the newest version from the Met Office. So this is the data we're still using, right, in, in all these reports. And they did a fantastic job that this works on the global scale, but on the regional scale, there's definitely something missing. And, the, and we are working really close with the Met Office to get um, certain things also into the mix for, for future stuff. Okay, so, and then we can be brave enough to jump to the real observation of that climate line I, I showed you before. This is now the Head 4 uh, uh, data set, which basically shows climate change between 1850 and 2000, I think, 18 or something like that, yes. And if we do now the reconstruction with our AI, we got um, uh, pretty much the same picture, but slight differences. And when we do now the same thing with CMIP AI, good again, it's quite similar, actually. The results are quite, quite, quite the same. And now we can do actually some climate science with that. Um, and we see a gl cooler global mean temperature in the first part, which basically means we have an underestimation of the global mean temperature trend. So basically, that means like if we are more correct, then climate change is even worse, right? That's basically would be the interpretation. Um, so, and then we already had some studies going on in uh, which said like the mid part. Um, of Helcruti is actually not so good and it's way too warm and we, we, we can definitely um, kind of support the, these other studies with that. And then there was a big discussion if the, in the late phase of, of the last um, 15 years, there was this so-called hiatus phase and there was a big discussion if climate change stopped. Um, and we could show also that kind of certain regions were, miss, um, were missing, so especially the polar regions. And there were already studies saying, oh, you, we miss out this information of that warming there. Um, and also the warmest year on record until then, right, was 2016. We just, we just got rid of it, right? So 2023 was uh, the new record. Um, but we got even a warmer record um, with, with this uh, AI stuff. Um, yeah, so it started in 2018 and 2020. We published this together with NVIDIA, and I was still at the Free University jumping to DKRZ. Um, we finished this back then. We published the code open source. The data is available. Um, and we were pretty proud that our technology, not just our technology, but also the data set itself in the end was analyzed in several chapters in the IPCC report. Um, that, was, that was actually pretty cool. And 
this is basically give you kind of a glimpse of what, what, where, where it's coming from. And now I jump through some other applications we done with this technology. And this will be tough because I cannot go into the details. But if you have questions later, just let me know, right? So to, to start with, we check repair radars. So everybody said, like, can you do precipitation? We said, okay, let's, let's try. So we are in the atmosphere, and you're looking at, a, at Germany. And this is our radar network you see uh, above. And you, we, we have uh, a lot of rain, especially in Hamburg. And um, so sometimes these radars actually fail. So and then this would be a case where three radars failed. And we tested if a radar, radar fails um, during times when we have like horrific rainfalls. Um, um, like, like here, in this case, the ground truth in the middle. Can we reconstruct that with our technology? And this worked. Um, then we said, OK, let's bring this to the maximum, right? How about we using just 72 weather stations, um, training with that radar data set, and see if we can bring a million grid points back? And of course, it, right, it, gets, it gets harder and harder. But I'm, I'm quite convinced that we are on a path here to get uh, a picture which is quite valid. And just think of the application, right? It's, of course, not about now or the future. But if we could go into the past with this, we have a lot of weather stations in the past, but we don't have radars. If we could jump back to the beginning of the 20th century, we could make even our climate data set out of this, right? And we are here on the hourly scale. Um, then we jumped into data assimilation. Now we're in the ocean. Uh, we check the heat content. We are on a monthly scale. In the 2000s, we have like a lot of observations, Argo floats flowing around and so on. And when we do a data assimilation with our Earth system model, so a coupled uh, atmosphere ocean model, um, we, we, we get this picture. And we are um, getting the same picture if we train with the neural network, which is actually was not the idea of that paper. We have a certain phenomena called the northwest corner. Um, we have that in here, and we, we basically trained the neural network on the Earth system model. Um, and, and when you go back to the 1950s, and you see we have a lot of missing values, the Earth system model fails of recreating that northwest corner. And I wouldn't show this right if, I, if this didn't work, but with the AI, we actually get this northwest corner in. So it's definitely an application also for data assimilation. Um, then we are looking into extremes and uncertainties. So we are trying to build right now a new HEDEX data set. So we, we, all the extreme indices going into the past. I will not go into the detail here. The nice thing about this application is also we see that we need some uncertainty information. And what we can do now, here you see that on the, on the right side, um, we actually can do give different answers to the same problem. And therefore, we can give some uncertainty with it. Um, then people always ask, can you do downscaling? Um, and so like, yeah, OK, let's try. Um, so we took uh, all the um, high-risk MIP runs from CMIP, um, got this to 0.5 degree, um, and tested if we could go to the 5 degree, which is kind of the observation grid we just saw in the other part of the talk, and check if we are able to get that back. And this works actually quite good. So this worked so good that this actually was quite boring. So we thought, OK, let's bring this to 10 degree. Let's bring it to 15 degree. Let's bring it to 20 degree, 25 degree, 30 degree. And we see, we see of course, some degrees in skill. Um, but, but I'm still impressed, right? So if you have this kind of information and you still get these patterns, these dipole patterns and so on into the mix, um, even with the 30 degree information, uh, that's quite cool. Just to give you a glimpse of what you could do with it, we could do data compression with it. Just think of we could throw away information and just get it back with the AI if we need it, right? I'm working at the HPC Center with a lot of storage problems. Um, that could be something in the future. Um, then we're also doing downscaling in the ocean. Um, here you see um, something on temperature and motion. We want to go to an um, ocean model with 600 meters, so getting really these small-scale algae. Um, and instead, we want to run a 10-kilometer version and get the 600 meters with the neural network. And even that um, worked quite nicely. And the, just to, to, to just to be using a lot of other techniques for other stuff, this was all the same technique, right? This is the software I showed you, which is on GitHub. It's all the same. Um, and then, now we're coming to the main part, right? So I, I give this talk actually like uh, in, in fall 2022 and like got a lot of great questions from MQ, right? So this was a, a really lovely evening actually with a lot of questions. And one question was like, 
okay, we have actually these 3D printed um, weather station and we have missing gaps. Can we do something with it, right? Um, and before we jump into the topic, I just want to quickly introduce the 3D printed automated weather stations, so-called 3D PAWS. They started in 2014 with that initiative. Paul is sitting here uh, with me, so he's, he's leading that, that initiative. And the goal is basically to kind of design these things to bring a, to a capacity building in regions where they cannot afford these high res uh, or very, very expensive um, weather stations. Um, so, and having especially these stations in data sparse regions um, to provide some early warning observation cap uh, capability and of course also have a low cost and in innovative sustainable solution to support the hydro. So everything was like droughts and floods and every, everything which is kind of in these region's pretty critical. Um, the nice thing with the 3D printers um, actually is that it's pretty inexpensive, right? You could always kind of reprint stuff. And these sensors are also, compared to the very, very uh, expensive ones, are pretty, pretty cheap. And they can be assembled locally, right? So you can give it actually to the communities. They can work with that on their own. And you can print and replace, right? Things get broken over time, and they can just fix it on their own. Um, I think that's a really cool initiative. Um, then the local partners can take ownership and take care of their own networks with it. You see some examples here on the right um, um, of these stations. Um, uh, and the station, the 3D printed station have like several um, metrological measurements on board, just to give you a glimpse here. So you have light sensor, you have a precipitation rate, so the, the, where the candy is in, right? So I think it's still full, right? So you can also give it another round, right? So I'm just saying. Um, you have wind speed, you have wind direction, and I know that stuff because in 2018, actually we did a 3D printed workshop in Berlin when I still was in the Free University, and we built a whole station there with the students from different universities. It um, was actually quite fun to do that. Um, yeah, so that's how I get into, the, in the, into this world. Um, and of course, we have also temperature on board, right? Um, and this is the... The, 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 the line you see of the temperature measurements, um, in this case, it's Barbados. Um, and they're doing minute recordings. Um, so they record a lot of data, which is really cool. But of course, you have some gaps in between, right? And uh, Brianna was kind of at this talk, or she was online. And she said, like, Chris, we have these gaps. What would you do, right? And, and I said, like, probably I also would use our technology uh, with that missing data issue here. Um, oh yeah, this is Barbados, uh, as I said. Um, and what I would do um, is basically train this one point information and put something like reanalysis data around it, right? So you see here now the ECMWF reanalysis 5, era 5 data. Uh, we took uh, eight grid boxes to the right and eight grid boxes down uh, around Barbados, uh, where the station is fairly enough in the middle. And we basically said, like, how about putting the spatial information where the memory is in, right, and train with that station. And the second we don't have the station anymore, we still have that reanalysis data set, and we could, like, reproduce that station. Um, yeah, and basically this idea appeared in that meeting. And uh, lucky enough, I have a student now in, in, at the DKRZ. He's pretty good at, at uh, programming, Timo. And he kind of um, booed this thing from December to now. And I got the last results actually last week. Um, and I'm happy to, to show that to you now. So the basic idea now for Barbados is that we have available data between 2020 and 2023. And we're using our encoder, decoder stuff. So that's basically the CNN we, we saw before. Um, yeah, our technology is basically called Cray, so Climate Reconstruction AI. And then we could build a digital twin, so a virtual weather station with that thing in, in Barbados. Um, we used um, the test data, we used 2020. Um, we used the training data in the, in the late phase. And in the background, you already see ERA-5. Um, this is the closest grid point of ERA-5. And this is something we, at least we have something to compare with. Um, because one idea could be, OK, that, let, let's use the closest grid point, right? So that could be the, the idea. Um, then we said, like, okay, maybe one station is not enough. Let's go for some station which is not in the ocean. Let's go for something uh, more city-like. So we are having um, here the data from Vienna. 
Um, that station is available since 2017. Um, and we used the test data in 2019, and with that we built, uh, a, want to build a digital twin of the virtual weather station in Vienna. Um, and then, of course, we also used the Marshall Station here from the Yucca field. Uh, we just went out there, actually, um, uh, on Sunday. I think we produced some missing data, right? You need, need to keep your job going, right? Uh, yeah, that's um, so. And there, there, we have the longest record, actually, 2016 to 2023. Um, we used the test data in 2021, and we want to build that digital twin here with the virtual weather station. Yes, and I dollied these images on the right, right? So, of course, I didn't come up with that, so I just used ChatGPT. Um, okay, let's have a look. Um, so, when we go to the Marshall Station in 2021, um, we are looking at two meter temperature here um, for, for the full year. We're looking at hourly values, um, and the, in black, you see the measurements. In red, you see the error 5 nearest grid point. And in blue, you see um, our reconstruction with the digital twin. And of course, it's pretty hard to see. Um, I got some RMSE here on top um, and some correlation. Um, I, I really don't want to go to the big evaluation here today, but it's uh, basically always a, a lower error than error 5, and it's always a higher correlation. Um, than error five, right? So I, I, I didn't want to go into the um, yeah, evaluation um, numbering here. So, so let's have a look into a week in, in winter and a one week in, in summer to get a glimpse of how good this works. Um, so we're looking here now in the week in January um, 2021, and we, we see that um, we, 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 we can get that line of the black of the observation of the real uh, measured values quite nice. And I think the most impressive stuff is actually in these times where the diurnal cycle is actually not going as much down as it is actually in era five. And just keep in mind, right, this is basically also our input data, right? So, um, so the AI kind of stays on that thingy, so it gets the bias correct and kind of keeps that quite nice, um, but also not always gets to the, to the um, maximum values, actually. We see that um, quite often. Um, in, a, in, the, in the week in summer, um, we, we see that uh, the same thing appears, that we follow this line actually quite nicely, um, um, especially compared to this grid point of era 5. And again, we see these glimpses where the, the diurnal cycle goes pretty low um, and the station doesn't. Um, and the, 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 at least the, the, the AI is able, the digital twin is able to keep that in the right amount of um, distance to the original station um, in summer. So we did a lot of weeks, actually we looked at a lot of data, but if you want to go, go for example, into the daily means here, so the difference to the measurements on the daily mean scale, um, yeah, we got an, um, an error of less than 0.5 degrees Celsius, which is actually quite nice. The correlation is already pretty, pretty high with the daily means. Um, and we are, of course, much closer than the error 5 grid point. Um, you could always argue, OK, maybe you just use another different station or something like this. Right? But it's, the, the idea was always to keep this whole procedure as flexible as possible. Um, and this is, I think, something which maybe um, Paul's group can help to kind of put this more into perspective. How good is it in the end in, in reality, right? Um, if we look into the monthly means, um, so, so the picture gets better and better now, right? So it's, it's, it's pretty close. We are having a much better um, seasonal cycle than this era five grid point, which potentially goes already into the mountains, right? With 31 kilometer um, distance. Um, so this, this works quite nice. And if we're looking at the daily cycle itself, so here from um, midnight to midnight, um, we actually see the, the issue with error five, and we see that we, with a digital twin here in, in the Marshall station, we stay quite close to, to the measured data. Um, if we go back to the hourly values and just check Vienna real quick, um, that is a random week now again. Um, we see uh, an interesting, like a lag shift. So you see that here a little bit. So the error five grid point is always kind of lagging behind. And we are able to correct that as well, which is quite cool. Um, the daily cycle works also quite nice. Just ignore the green line uh, in that case. We tested some stuff, it didn't work out. Um, that that is, was also quite good. And even more crazy, of course, is now Barbados, right? Because 
you have the ocean, it's basically everywhere is ocean, so you don't have really a daily cycle. However, the station has like a strong daily cycle because it's on land, right? And that's why you see this huge difference here between the red line and the blue line. Um, I think we, we get the black line actually quite, quite nice. Um, same goes for the, um, so the daily cycle. As I said, we have always a little low bias here. Uh, that's definitely something we should work on. Um, yeah, and this is basically what I brought with me. So um, we have now this digital twin technology where you can basically say the network, here's the station, here's the data, um, download error five in a certain region around that station, kind of train this whole thing, and then please fill up the whole stuff, right? And this is what we did. We have now an infilled version of the Marshall station. We have an infilled version of Vienna, and we have an infilled version of Barbados, which failed miserably, right, if you see that. Um, and we're like, oh, yeah, okay. So because I, I didn't show that before, but that thingy here in the end uh, in the data messed up this whole stuff, right? So we need to have quality control data. This is what I said in the beginning, right? Think about the data. You, you need to make sure this works, um, that you don't fall into the trap. So the AI overinterpreted this grid point then many times in the timeline. So I'm, I'm saying we're not done, right? So um, it's, I, I always love then if things also always just work with everything, right? So um, that made me happy. So what, what, what's missing? Um, I think the full evaluation, where I think uh, Yuka um, and Paul's group can help a lot. Um, the minute data, right? So temperature, it's pretty boring, right? I guess between two hours, it's pretty linear. But the moment we step into precip or wind, could get actually quite interesting with the minute data. Uh, other instruments, other sensors, right? Paul just already said like precip would be nice to test next. Um, I also think like if maybe the temperature sensor fails on, on one instrument and you have it still running on the other, you could definitely connect that. Um, probably also you can learn from the other measurements, right? At least like wind should tell you something about precip and so on and so on, right? Um, then um, a checker for data issues, the sort of Barbados case, right? So that's definitely something um, we should make sure that the training is on data which is quality controlled. Um, and a checker for minimum observations. So that was the first thing actually Andreas asked me today, uh, like how do you know how much data you need to train this thing? And I said, I don't know, right? So actually we have to work on this to find out how much data we need. Is a year enough or not? Can we maybe write something that we give an uncertainty with it and the longer the time series of the data gets and we have data to train on, maybe the uncertainties get decreased, right? Something like this uh, I think uh, would be nice. How to make it operational, right? That's definitely a, a question we, we should ask at, at that moment when you really want to get it into, into the mix. Um, what could we do with it? Of course, we could infill missing observations, right? That was the, the first questions asked. We could do that now. We don't use any recurrent neural network to do some time series predictions or something. We again using the space saying, ah, we're using the space around the station because there's the memory. Um, that, that worked quite nice. We could do this now. Um, we could actually, let's assume we trained on a very good high quality data. We could use this thing to test the data which is measured right now, right? If you measure with your station and you could ask again um, this digital twin, what would be the value if you would ask error five and this digital twin? What would be the result? You could check the differences. If the differences are just too far off from each other, maybe a human should look into it, right? I think that could be a good application. Um, then it could actually act as a digital twin, right? So we could jump into cases where we never been before, right? We could, we could check other weather situations. We could train basically in a virtual space to test the instruments, right? Not fully, but uh, to, uh, uh, there's, there's some space to get some really cool results, I think, with it. And then I was just thought like, okay, we have ERA5 now, some real analysis data with it, and we're getting some local station information. That means we could also just use weather predictions, right? You could use the European or the American weather prediction taking the same eight grid boxes and make a local prediction for that station. Should work out of the box, I think, if the weather prediction doesn't have so much biases compared to error five. But yeah, you, that, that, that's something to think about, but that would be really cool. Then you have an AI local prediction for the station. And then you could check if the measured values actually work out or not. Um, yes, to sum up, 
this whole journey now is so we came from a photo technology, so it actually started like this, right? I was just on that, on, on a YouTube channel and watching that video, and um, and I, w I was quite amazed what what is possible, and it's so outdated now, right? So that's so funny. Um, I think the mixture of machine learning and numerical models work quite nice. So we trained there with numerical models to get these things done. We now also using ERA five. We mixing. The, the, this triangle of AI observations and numerical models, it's actually quite cool. And I think this, this is the space where a lot of things will happen in the, in the near, in next years. Um, then I showed you the climate research. So the combination of these three things actually was quite successful um, to kind of bring that image technology to, to the climate realm. Um, then I just jumped through a lot of applications, uh, which was probably a little bit too fast, but we're doing super resolution, we're broken weather, broken weather radars, um, cyclones I didn't even talk about, um, data assimilation, extremes and uncertainties. Um, yeah, if you have questions, then we can talk about this. And then uh, I, I brought basically the, the idea with me and the application and already some results, uh, which uh, came up like um, in 2022. And uh, we kind of mixed this now up to a new um, technology, which are three digital twins for the stations for temperature, three stations in Barbados, in Vienna, and uh, here in Colorado. And um, I think this would be a nice application in the future for capacity building and so on. So I'm, 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 I, I, was, I was quite amazed actually by all these results, and I'm so happy that um, this could be an idea to go forward with this. So um, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to take some questions, so thank you very much. All right, thank you. Some questions? Yeah, uh, thanks, Chris. Um, so uh, that's really exciting. I think one of the things I was wondering about with uh, machine learning and AI <clears throat> is how to train it to know what it doesn't know. Like, so uh, it struck me, like, looking at the radar pictures, like, our, our eyes were visually pleased to see all that detail, mm -hmm. but how much of that detail is actually making that, predict that filling better when, a, a, like, a coarser fill might have been more accurate? Um, and, the, and then and I think in the weather station space, it's like, is there a way to <clears throat> have the learning tell us how certain it is. Mm -hmm. and, and I don't see a lot of that in results I see for machine learning, and I, I think that's really be a great place to dig in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's it's two very important points, right? So um, I usually say for the first part, how do we deal with things we haven't seen, probably also climate change is changing stuff. I usually have the answer kind of in my pocket because we use these numerical models to train our thing. We cannot just train on the historical experiments, but also on the scenarios. Um, and then you get at least this into, into the mix. Um, but you're absolutely right. So the, the, the question of how fine a result has to be to get better results is something um, which, which is in, in, in the community now pretty big. And we do this as well in the downscaling realm. Actually, we, we see already that if we're going from very low to very high resolution, it's better to do this stepwise um, and, 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 and not going the full distance, actually. We, we, we see that. Um, and Graphcast, Google, um, just kind of made that tweak into their model that they go through the scales. And, and that was the reason why they're now so good at it. So you're absolutely right. There is something where we have to think as a climate community or weather community how to get our knowledge into these things. And um, actually, with the radar, just if you ask, we just wanted to see actually if we get it right, get it done. So that that was basically the the, the whole idea. We wanted to see if we um, coming to that. So here, right? So um, if if we if we're coming close to a picture, which could be something, and I'm, I'm so with you, right? We, we should have thought about, maybe we should have gone to a much broader picture first, right? That actually could help. And of course, this is, a, this is cherry picking right now, right? This is a result which worked pretty good. So the moment we have really small cells, this thing is not getting it. Sometimes actually it does these, 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 these minor, minor thingies here, and I am usually call this like, um, suggestions of rain, um, which is probably 
okay to say, um, but yeah, actually this could be nice to, to go now with this idea to, to, uh, to, let's see if we get the 50 kilometer scale before we go to the one kilometer scale. That's a very, very important point. And then the last point was the XAI or stuff, right? Asking the model. This is actually, I didn't bring with me, I just told to Andreas that I should bring some slides in with the LRP methods. We, we, we do that now. So we, we basically do these predictions and then you ask the model where the heck you are looking at to make your prediction, right? So with these 72 stations, it's um, then usually there where, where it was rain, right? This is um, the, not the most exciting stuff, but here we can do this in all these expert, uh, um, thingies. We can check where, where was the, the most important information to make that picture. Um, so the whole called XAI, explainable AI realm is very important, yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Chris. <clears throat> so I think you showed us examples for where you trained the AI model temporally and spatially. Are you combining those two? Like especially for, for the radar, for example, if you would do hourly or 10 minute, like there's information in the previous hour and you want to have this consistency. Yes, um, yeah, actually we, we, we did that. Um, I have that here in the, in the background. Um, so we, we, we used our baseline model, so really the image to image technology, which is still nice because it is so cheap in terms of compute, right? So this is the thing. And then we added actually the, the time information into the channel, so you can easily do that, right? So just think of an image which is red, red green, blue, RGB, um, and just put the time information there. And we also tested if we could add some info atmospheric informations there as well. And then we used the advanced methods which would be an LSTM, so long short term memory. So that's the technology usually used to make it's basically a recurrent neural network kind of takes the time information, saves some memory, and puts it into the future. And we used atmospheric and some attention module. That's what the stuff you were asking. And we already saw with the green that's basically indicating that this got much better then. And then we combined this, and we see with the LSTM um, already an improvement um, for, for total precipitation. We still have that low bias, right? That's definitely something we should work on. Um, and in the end, when we combine not just time, but also some variables like temperature, pressure, and so into and put it into a uh, wind, of course, um, then we reduce the bias um, like a lot, and the results got better. Um, but I usually have this but, there's always a but. Um, Having this attention module on a kilometer scale um, over Germany and running also the LSTM and the attention module together, on our old HPC, we were not able to run it on one node, on one single node. And then we would have been going to some software development to make that happening. On, and then, I mean, that was a master thesis at that point. And we said, like, OK, well, we, we don't do that now. So. Um, Yes, it's improving it. We see that. It makes it also more expensive, also slightly more complex in terms of running this whole thing. Yeah, but it works. And it definitely, where the time information is important, you, you should think about it, right? Um, and that's also something we can discuss with the 3D pause station, actually. Thank you so much. Very interesting talk. Very um, visually uh, pleasing results. Um, so I give two examples. and then my question will become obvious. So if, you, if I see these time series at the bottom, uh, there's always the diurnal cycle in there. And so if, if you would sort of erase this magenta and give it to me, I would be pretty good at filling this in, right? <laughs> because it's a sine wave, and then it's some sort of anomalies with a certain standard deviations around it. Um, and uh, your radar sample looks really nice, but it seems that the model really missed something really important as well, these fronts on the left side, right? It seems it's not a heterogeneous problem. You have these fronts and these streaks, and, and your radar is, is very diffusive. It's just averaging something out. My guess, it's a gaussian mitchell model you're using. I don't know. But um, so there might be other um, AI methods that would be better at picking up these fronts, these sort of in homogeneous aspects. Mm -hmm. So to come to my question is, how much of the impressive high-res pictures you're generating is just sort of a linear weighting because something's smooth on the large scale and some high-resolution variability in space and time on it? And how much is really a linear combination? And how much does AI, the machine learning, the nonlinear aspects really add? and make that possible. 
Yeah, that's yeah, that's a that's a very very good point. Um, so you're right. You could be able to to do that, right? So to kind of fill that in, um, and then would be of course the question I just wanted to bring. Up. I want to bring up this picture again, um, which is the difference, right? So then you you see that you could argue now. Okay, even if I do the sine or cosine function, um, and then look at the difference, it probably also would work. Um, um, the, 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 that's what I mean with the full evaluation, right? So we, we, the, the nice thing is actually that we don't work with the data itself right now. We're using error five and bringing it to the station. That's kind of the beauty of it. So there's actually no chance of cheating besides the fact that we are using the same atmosphere we're living in, right? Because the error, error five is kind of bringing that, that space to the station. Um, but we, we, we don't, we don't use the station information on, 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 on times where, and, and, and then we're changing the station information. That would be more critical in terms of, okay, just fill in this, this beautiful line of these things. So what I, what I mean is I can just fill in any point at any time. I don't do the time series here, right? We are just using this one hour and we're using one value and we're using one image. That's what we do. And then we connect all these results of the neural network to make this line. So that's that's goes. It's a little bit different than kind of learning this cosine function and fill in. That's what, and I fully agree. And this was basically the answer I gave two years ago when I said I wouldn't do time series prediction because that that you fell into this trap. But what we could do is like bring in a result for any given moment in time. That's that that's the one thing. And the the other thing, what would be the the advantage of bringing these uh, high risk information of the of the precip, right? For example, like like these things, right? Um, and the question is like, it's definitely more than statistics. We tested it against other statistical methods, so Kriging, for example, and we, we bring in, let's say, this I, right, this pattern recognition. We, we are able to get things into the mix which are, which were, you, you don't see it in the picture and the AI says there is a phenomena, we should bring it up. Um, but I don't say that this always works. And we see issues. And probably this is what Gretchen said, like would be a great thing actually to maybe should do the infilling and we should also maybe do even doing this thing here, um, maybe on different scales. And it could be actually that if you, if you have certain uh, networks for certain situations, you could even get the small scale thing is right because probably most of the time the non-values in precip are kind of are a mess, right? And that's, you could argue that's maybe not so important at least to get the rain, but maybe we need a convective neural network, maybe you need a large scale neural network and so on. Um, that's how I would tackle that. Um, and we see that we definitely, we always test this against other statistical methods um, to bring this into the mix. And I think I have something here with me where, yes, here, for example, this is, um, the, 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 this is the, the, our version is basically on the top right on the left side, you see the ground truth of the radars, and you see the issues, right? But if you compare that to error five, you see in the middle left, and the downscaled version, are we having a numerical model now on top, so this is Cosmo now, having a downscaled reanalysis, you see that on the top uh, middle right, and even on a two kilometer scale on the bottom left, you see that result here, um, this is, really cost extensive, right? If you do that, that's really expensive. And I love numerics, right? I love the numerical models, don't get me wrong, but this, to produce that, that takes ages, and it needs this whole chain coming from some large-scale reanalysis, going to a medium reanalysis, going to a local-scale reanalysis, like here, RIA2, and to compare basically the top, the bottom left here to the bot, uh, top right um, in comparison to the ground truth, I, I would say we are not so bad, actually. Having just these stations, you see that's again, right? So the stations we used. So I think we bring something new to the table, right? So even if, okay, numerical modeling is probably better, right? But um, it's also really expensive. And, and sometimes you need answers fast. And I think we are quite good in getting certain things. Um, uh, yeah, you see here, actually, I, I, I go now to the, to the thing. You see that these um, indicators of rain. This is what I, what I meant before. You see these actually quite nice here. Um, 
I know this was maybe not a satisfying answer, but a long answer. And uh, yeah, thank you for the question. Let's do one more question. Um, I have a question about the time series analysis too, with regard to how, like what variables are you training from era five? Are you doing it just with the temperature? Just temperature, yeah. So then in some of those examples where you could see that the different chain amplitude of the diurnal cycle was being picked up by the mm -hmm. training, mm -hmm. I'm really curious how it's doing that if temperature is the only variable that it really is looking after. And then my second question on this too is, is there a dependence on the length of the time gap as to how well that this gap filling will be performing? That, that, yeah, yeah. To, to answer with the, to answer the second question first, right? Um, that's maybe that was wasn't so clear. But we're actually doing this infilling for each time. We can do it randomly, actually, and we just put together the time series. So we have no information of. So this week was reconstructed like hour by hour, and then we just put it together. And we get a result of that one hour, you get a result of another hour, and then we do this. There is no time connection between these dots. The time connection comes through the fact that era five has the time in, in reality correct. Um, yes, that, that's the, I mean, that, that's, that's pretty mind blowing, right? So I, I agree. And the, 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 these cases where it doesn't fall down or don't fall to the trap, but on other cases it actually goes down, right? Like here in this case, um, that basically means, probably that means we had enough data to learn the local effects of that. Um, and probably we get even better if we add other variables here, right? So I usually like to start easy, right? And if it's already look so good, because then it's much easier to, to do certain things. But I'm pretty sure the moment we want to do humidity or wind or precip, we need a little bit more than this. Um, yeah, but yeah, it's also I wanted to keep the pressure low on the bachelor student here to all kind of, <laughs> so. Um, yeah, so I, th that's, I think, what, what happened. So I learned these local effects on, on these cases where it doesn't fall into the trap. Um, and probably this means we had enough data to train on. OK. So uh, Chris is leaving tomorrow, I believe. But he said he will be back probably within a year. If people want to chat, of course, you can contact him through email yes. or whatnot. And also, um, we'll go out here for refreshments after. So let's uh, thank the speaker once more.